territories. Thirdly, that relations between Israel, the Palestinians, and the rest of the Arab world will be normalized as a third stage at least two steps are carried out. Now, in the Oslo Agreement, there was supposed to be a five-year interim period to, until 1999, where the uh, agreement will be complete. That is, the Israeli occupation is ending and the Palestinian state is established. Now we are in 2016, and it is not that the Israeli occupation is not ending. The Israeli occupation is fortified with the uh, two aspects of this fortification of the occupation. Number one is the continued settlement of the Palestinian territory in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, which is the base for the future Palestinian state. But when it is settled by the Israelis, bringing immigrants from all over the, the world and facilitating their uh, presence in this territory, it means that they uh, would not uh, give room for the establishment of the Palestinian state. Second is that the, the Israel is controlling the lives of the Palestinians after 23 years of signing of that agreement. The movement is, of the Palestinians within their country is restricted. The development of their land, now they divided according to the Oslo, they divided the, the land of the West Bank and East Jerusalem into three areas, area A, area B, area C. Area C, which is about 62% of the total area of the West Bank, is totally controlled security-wise and administrative-wise by the Israelis. If, if, if a Palestinian builds a house for his children or for himself, the Israelis will come and demolish that house. The number of houses being demolished in, the, in this year, year 2016, exceeded uh, 300 houses thus far. Total villages were destroyed, erased to the ground, especially one in the, in the Negev. It was destroyed a hundred times. Each time they destroyed, the uh, community were rebuilt it once more, and then they come and destroy it again. Uh, so the, the uh, international community or the United Nations or the American administration, which is the lead of these efforts for implementing the Oslo Accords, they formed a, a committee called the Quartet from the United States, the United Nations, European Union, and uh, Russia. This Quartet is supposed to look after the implementation of the agreements. Unfortunately, the Quartet was impotent uh, due uh, to the influence of the American administration on the quartet, the outcome. In fact, the representative of the American administration uh, in the whole process was Dennis Ross. Dennis Ross, who uh, gave a speech to the Central Synagogue in Washington and New York about uh, two months ago, where he admitted that he was the advocate of Israel and Israeli policies rather than the objective advocate of peace and peacemaking between Israelis and Palestinians. And that shows from the start, of course, was clear, but not anyone is admitting that the American administration was biased from day one. And they wanted to manage the conflict rather than solve the conflict. Lately, we have the French who came up with an initiative uh, they, want, they knew where are the uh, loopholes in the, in the quartet uh, process. Uh, so they called 28 foreign ministers of important uh, countries that are related somehow from the region and from the international scene. They met in Paris on the 3rd of June. They agreed that this conflict has to be solved within a framework of international settlement, like how they solved the Iranian nuclear uh, uh, problems. They have the five plus one group that met for months, but they have one goal, it's to prevent Iran from developing its nuclear capabilities. 
The same thing, the French initiative says that an international conference should be held before the end of this year, whereby it will uh, apply Security Council resolutions relevant to the conflict, which calls for ending the Israeli occupation and establishing the Palestinian state. Uh, there is some resentment on the part of the Americans. Uh, they don't want, it seems to me, to, to leave their lead role in, in the Middle East, uh, including the peace process, and protection of the Israeli uh, continued policies of aggression and discrimination. Now, in Israel itself, there are some voices, not from the progressive elements in Israel, and there are a few, of course, now, but even from the establishment, in the Knesset, the head of the Israeli opposition, major opposition, Herzog, he said in his speech when the Knesset opened its session uh, early in, in uh, June, he said that Israel is drifting to fascism and racial status. This is, uh, should be a warning, not only for the, the people in the region, but also should be a warning for the friends of Israel, especially in the Jewish communities abroad. Is this Israel that they wanted or they dreamed of having when it is going that way? Thus far, about 40, 40 resolutions, whether passed in the Knesset or still tabled, discussed in the second or first reading. These 40 resolutions are still as racist resolutions. When there are voices saying that in the, the hospitals, maternity uh, quarter, they should separate the Palestinian uh, ladies who are given birth uh, from the Israeli ones because they don't want to be contaminated by the uh, quote unquote going uh, women. That's one of the things. Even renting houses, you would see signs within the Israeli uh, uh, cities or townships or quarters, uh, no Arabs allowed. This, they is, the Jews themselves suffered from this discrimination in the past. And it should, uh, it should hit a, a, a road nerve in them and oppose these practices. The voices within Israel are still very small. The, 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 the reason, I think Israel has been drifting on its political system towards extreme uh, and the right that denies everybody else's except them. Uh, and here, the voice has to be strong outside. Uh, what is offered now? order to live in, in perpetuation of conflict, of bloodshed, of, of hatred, of whatever, or discrimination, or subjugation, I think there is a chance uh, that uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis can live side by side, but not one instead of the other, side by side. Maybe in the future, if they can decide to have closer relations, that comes with time. But otherwise, if it is not, if the Palestinians continue to be denied their right to self-determination, their right to be as human beings treated equally with respect to their human rights, with respect to their national rights, I'm sure this will not uh, help bringing about peace and stability in the region. Therefore, we would like to see an international voice like the voice which helped end the apartheid regime in South Africa through pressure on the apartheid regime that the right must be supported by everyone and anyone who drifting from denying the others should be stopped and uh, try to uh, create a better future for both Israelis and Palestinians. I think that uh, we have the opportunity of uh, conversing with uh, Abdullah Abdullah at this moment. Uh, so I would invite you uh, to uh, 
present uh, any questions that you may have uh, for this uh, rather unique op opportunity here in, in Canada and Quebec. Uh, so I, if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead. If you'd like any elaborations, please ask. Uh, but I think it's rather obvious uh, that uh, we have uh, an accurate representation of what the current co political context is and the prospects uh, for a, a true uh, peaceful uh, resolution of this conflict, which has been held by the Palestine Liberation Organization since its inception uh, in 1964. Mm. In which uh, the uh, um, eventual uh, solution to the, uh, the Zionist nation state uh, uh, structure, superstructure, is the uh, program of, that was presented by the PLO at the time, which was calling for a democratic secular Palestine. And uh, since that time, in the course of geopolitical negotiations, of course, we have been presented with the, uh, the Oslo uh, principles of 1993. And uh, it has uh, become evident as well that uh, this agreement, all those signed by the Zionist administration of the state, has not been implemented. In fact, now we have seen the quasi-annexation of the entire Jordan River Valley and the prospect of the annexation of Sector C, which is 62% of the West Bank. So, uh, when um, the Zionist state has made concessions, it has been under duress. For instance, when it withdrew from Gaza, where there were uh, a number of uh, Zionist colonies uh, that uh, amounted to a rather minimal number of, uh, of uh, settlers, so-called, who are actually the uh, colonialists. And uh, it required uh, some 5,000, the presence of 5,000 troops there in order to uh, uh, guarantee their, uh, their continued you know, um, uh, presence on the, on the land there because of the concentration of the population of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, 80% of whom are refugees from uh, 48, uh, the Zionist State of Israel. So. Sorry. Uh, I excuse myself. Thank you very much. We cannot ask you a question. If you can, I'm <laughs> here. I talk to one. Unless you're committed. Us. No, no. It's, there are three other sessions. Okay. May I just a quick question I, I for already, him and then later for you? I already invited okay. you, yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for what you have presented to us. And I will now discuss uh, the Oslo Agreement with all its problems. My question to you uh, as a Palestinian, uh, uh, what do you think is um, uh, currently our role as grassroots activists living in the West? Uh, like there's one uh, social movement taking place, global solidarity movements in the context of BTS, but there are any, like many other uh, ideas maybe that you can do, like what do you suggest? Uh, uh, we are promoting the uh, international uh, moral pressure on the aggressive policies of Israel. And this is expanding, no doubt uh, that the situation, I can compare the situation when I came back, I came here to this country in 1972, and this, uh, what is now, it's completely different. There is more awareness, there is more engagement of the younger generation, especially with the social uh, media, uh, and many of them, in fact, were of the Jewish faith, because the ideas of Judaism that these people were taught as uh, every religion teaches their own ideas and their values, and when they compare to what is happening in Israel, it, it, it does not uh, coincide with it. It's, and therefore, they are concerned what would happen the future, if there is no Palestinian state created in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And this is, the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip is 20, about 20, 22% of the total area of Palestine. 
Okay, so when we accept this historical compromise of accepting this, it means we wanted to have a base for our people to identify with. If that is not happening, what would happen west of the Jordan River in historic Palestine? There would be two distinct peoples, the Palestinians and the Israelis. In fact, if we were to compare numbers, the Palestinians are probably a bit more in number than the Israeli uh, Jews, uh, more than six million each side. Uh, given that about 750,000 Israelis are living permanently in North America, but still counted as Israelis and they're counted there. So what would happen in this case? And that's a question that's posed really before the Jews more than anybody else. Israel has one of two options in this case. It cannot be democratic, as they claim Israel is the only democracy they see. But it cannot be democratic, because democratic means one man, one voice, one vote. And then Israel will lose its uh, control of, the, of the, this area, region, west of the Jordan River. Then it has to apply apartheid uh, rule, exactly a second South Africa in the 21st century. Is this uh, Israel that the Jews wanted to see? This question has been raised, but very in a shy way among some Jew Israeli thinkers inside Baghdad. But they are the overwhelming uh, control of, 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 of Israel there is the extreme right, the fascist elements. Uh, look at the composition of the Israeli government of today. There is no voice for even uh, middle uh, voices. The labor, for example, is oh, ruled Israel from 1948 until 1977 continuously and then shared in, uh, and afterwards. Now, they, they, are, uh, no, they have no influence whatsoever on the Israeli general public. Their, uh, their power is reduced even further by the overwhelming power that is shared by the extreme uh, racist discriminatory elements within Israeli political system. Uh, therefore, uh, we believe that there is no military solution to the Israeli Palestinian And that can, one can trace back to 1979 after the signing of Camp David between Israel and Egypt. But then, uh, also, it's impossible for the apartheid-like regime in Israel to continue against the Palestinians. But the Palestinians are the only people in the world under occupation, denied their right to self-determination, which is considered one of the basic fundamental rights in the Human Rights Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Therefore, uh, we, we believe that mounting pressure on the Israeli, within the Israeli political uh, scene Especially, uh, they are very much worried about the BDS activities, its role in bringing about, so it's, it's considered a political aspect. Uh, as the United Church of Canada uh, explained their uh, stand on boycotting the Israeli uh, settlements products, they said this is a product of a stolen land and God did not allow us to buy or eat or use stolen goods. Therefore, we decide to boycott the products from the Israeli settlements. That's one aspect. Then another aspect is that the uh, small number of uh, Israelis who are conscious of uh, human rights of others, who uh, have equality with others, who are also very much concerned of the future of what Israel they wanted to see in the future that is living in harmony, living in normal relations with its neighbors, with no threat to security or no threat to safety, but rather uh, and, uh, a very uh, acceptable uh, norm of, of, of life between uh, the Israelis and their neighbors, as it was the case before the creation of Israel in 1948, recorded by one Israeli uh, uh, 
very well known, a Moshe Minuan, the father of Yehudi Minuan, the violinist, who wrote a book, The Decadence of Judaism in Our Times, where he described how, as a young Jew coming in 1916 to Palestine from Russia, how he was treated with his mother uh, by a Palestinian doctor, uh, and how they were playing uh, in the streets with the Palestinian kids, until Zionism came and created this conflict, this cleavage between Palestinians and Israelis. We believe that with some uh, strong, I mean, there are several factors actually, not one factor that can contribute to the end. Number one, we, we need to stick to, to our principles and uh, try to uh, reach out to as many people as possible. We rely very much on what we call the non-Palestinian Palestinians, plus, of course, of Palestinian Jews. But the non-Palestinian Palestinians, those who read about the question of Palestine, who were become sympathetic, who are supporters of the protection of the human rights of the Palestinians as human beings, to protect their right to self-determination, to end the occupation and the restriction on their movement in their own country. Now, this uh, we try to, and uh, of course, our presence here to this forum is in that direction, to reach out to as many people as we can, to get support as much as we can. And finally, I believe, uh, when this uh, support is, is universal, it will make an impact on Israel and any Israeli government in the future. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, we understand that you uh, are required to make uh, your interventions in uh, the other uh, activities as well. So um, I can move now to... Um, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Abdullah Dullah's uh, presentation and uh, my presentation is being recorded and will be uh, uploaded to YouTube so it can be used as a resource uh, at, on other occasions because this opportunity is is rather rare, actually. Um, let me check to see that I'm recording this properly. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of uh, my own background and qualifications, uh, uh, in order to do my doctoral studies, I came from Ontario, from Toronto, here to Montreal, to uh, uh, continue my doctoral studies at the uh, University of Quebec in Montreal. Learned French in order to do my doctoral thesis. Uh, because uh, no other political science department in a Canadian university would allow me to do a doctoral thesis, even though I was qualified to do so. I. Uh, started doing my uh, university studies in, uh, in a Bachelor of Science in Physics, actually, at the University of Waterloo. But because of Palestine, I found it necessary to uh, drop the uh, scientific studies and uh, went into the graduate school in political science in order to pursue uh, um, the study of uh, political theory, political philosophy, and uh, uh, the uh, methodology required to do a, a proper critique of, uh, of the Zionist ideology, uh, which uh, I have now, now done, uh, now accomplished. And uh, my, my doctoral thesis, which is uh, published uh, there actually, does a critique of Zionism, not from a historical point of view, because that's been done. The, uh, the new historians, you know, specifically the most uh, principal of which is uh, Professor uh, Ilan Pape at Exeter University in England has done an excellent you know, breakdown of what happened in 48 and, and uh, the, uh, the plan, Dalit, uh, of the Zionist militias at that time to expel the population of Palestinians to the greatest extent possible 
to achieve the occupation of the greatest uh, amount of territory possible. So even though the UN Resolution 181 was, uh, was the uh, legal justification for the establishment of the Zionist state, nonetheless, we find that the uh, end result of the war of 1947 to 48, actually, because the Zionist war against the Palestinian people started before the recognition of the uh, state of uh, Israel by the United Nations, and the expulsion of the Palestinians began before the UN actually took up uh, and supported the resolution for the recognition of the Zionist state. And uh, the amount of territory that was allocated under Resolution 181 was about a third of the territory of Palestine. And uh, during the War of 47-48, the Zionist militias took control over two-thirds of the territory of Palestine. So, while the uh, Zionist state claims Resolution 181 as justification for its legitimate existence and recognition internationally in the geopolitical system, actually, uh, you know, Resolution 181 is a denial of the legitimacy of the present-day Zionist state because it uh, exemplifies the fact that the Zionist militias disregarded the resolution and the frontier that was established by the partition resolution, so-called, and went beyond that uh, frontier to establish the 1948 State of Israel, which was later recognized by the United States of America within uh, the same day. Actually, Russia beat uh, the United States to the recognition of the Zionist State of Israel because the Communist parties throughout the world were pro-Zionist at the time and actually supplied not only diplomatic and propaganda support through the various communist parties, but actually supplied the arms from Czechoslovakia so that the Zionist militias were able to fight and uh, win that uh, particular war against the Palestinians. Now, in terms of uh, the, uh, the work that I've been able to do, do so uh, rather than going into the historical aspects, uh, and uh, rather than going into the uh, Judaic critique of Zionism, which is done as well by various individuals like Min, uh, Min, uh, Minhuin's uh, father, and uh, even some conservative, you know, right-wing uh, critiques uh, of Zionism, like the book Perfidy, which uh, critiques, you know, the Zionist militias as well. Uh, there is a modern-day uh, critique of uh, Judaic critique of Zionism from Professor Yaakov Rapkin, who teaches at the University of Waterloo, uh, uh, excuse me, University, uh, Université de Montréal, uh, here. And, uh, and uh, so, those areas have been taken care of. What I have done is an elaborate critique of the Zionist ideology in political philosophy, going back to the origins of the nation-state concept which has been used by the Zionist ideologues to establish a state uh, along the lines of, uh, of, uh, of European you know, political uh, uh, philosophy 200 years later, totally out of context, in a completely different uh, part of the world, which has had a history um, which is very much older than that of Europe. You know, in Europe, the nation-state concept could be floated, you know, for a while, because Europe was colonized uh, only uh, after uh, the long period in which, you know, the Middle East was, so, you know, was, uh, you know, peopled, you know, by the migrant, the human migration patterns coming out of uh, Africa. So, in the Middle East, we have, you know, cities established, you know, seven thousand years ago. Some of the first cities in the world, in uh, in Jericho, in uh, in uh, Salome, uh, which was you know the predecessor of the city now called Nablus, or in Hebrew it's called Shem, which is the Israelis now use. When I actually went to Tel Aviv to visit uh, my cousin who was uh, visiting her parents who still live there, and uh, people would ask me, where am I living? And I would say in Nablus. And the Israelis did not know the name Nablus for that city, that Palestinian city, which is one of the major cities you know, in the West Bank. They call it Shem. 
from the biblical, you know, Hebraic name. Incredible, you know, like difference, you know, in mentalities between the Israelis, well-meaning Israelis as well, who just do not know anything about the Palestinians. And in fact, in the entrance to the Palestinian cities, there's these huge red, you know, uh, signs there, which proclaim in three languages that it is illegal for Israelis to enter into a Palestinian city under Israeli law, and they're subject to two years imprisonment if an Israeli goes into a Palestinian city. That's how much, you know, apartheid has been established there. It's, it's ingrained in the very law. Okay, so I have a formal presentation, which is going to be the introduction to a new book of mine, dealing with the transitional process of how, with the eventual recognition of the Palestine state, which I think is coming up in the Security Council in November, after the American election, and the French resolution is going to be presented to the Security Council, calling for the recognition of the state of Palestine, which has already been adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations, but the Security Council seems to have uh, more authority and geopolitical ma machinations. So this is a crucial vote, and this time, the United States uh, State Department is probably not going to veto the resolution. So Palestine is going to be recognized as an independent state in the short term uh, after the American election and before Obama hands over you know, presidential authority to the winner of that election in January. So there's November, December, January, anything can happen. And it is expected that the United States is not going to veto uh, that resolution. So how do we proceed from that point forward? This is what I am beginning to address now. And uh, the introduction I have here is going to form the introduction to the introductory preface to uh, this new book in which I'm writing about the transitional process. Okay, first of all, I'd like to express my respects to the DSTT Culture Committee here in Montreal, which stands for Diversity, Social Solidarity, Tolerance, and Transparency. And, uh, it's uh, organizer Tarek Taha, with whom I'm working here in Montreal. Um, I would welcome you to the session of the World Social Forum 2016. The forum is one with which I identify because of the momentum that is created on an international dimension that works to become a world constituent assembly that will supersede the existing nation states and its so-called United Nations. While there are now 104, 194 recognized nations in the General Assembly, with Palestine being the 194th, it should be known that there are actually about 3,000 nations throughout the world in sociological terms. So in the actuality uh, of uh, social existence in the world, the United Nations does not represent the people of the world. It represents the nation states, the geopolitical system, and ignores all those nations that have not been able to achieve their independence, and ignores all the nations that are confined within the existing nation states and that do not have the recognition of a nation. And uh, we can think of many such nations, uh, including the Quebecois nation, the Kurdish nation, etc., etc. So. To break out of the bonds of the geopolitical world, we need to go to the civil society of each nation and to unite our civil societies as we are doing here at the Forum. My own origin is that of a refugee kid from a Jewish family that had lived in Poland, both Warsaw and the city of Lublin. You should know that while the Zionist parties have used the Nazi Holocaust to justify a colonial project of occupation and non-expulsion, it was actually in the USSR Soviet Union that the most Jewish people fled to in order to escape from the Nazis. So about 500,000 escaped to Russia, while the Zionists made deals with the Nazi regime to get 60,000 of their own party members out of Germany and only 1,843 out of Hungary. And yet the Zionist mentality continues to claim its superior position as a refuge of the Jewish people, even while they did so little to actually save the Jewish people during the Nazi occupation of Poland and the other regions there. Now, the great thing about being a second generation survivor was that my mother was from Warsaw and she was a Jewish Bundist. 
know. You probably don't know what the Jewish Bund was because not only is the history of the Jewish Bund suppressed by the, uh, the forces that uh, the political, political science uh, departments that failed to recognize uh, the existence of the Jewish people before the establishment of the state of Israel, because before that the Jewish nation was not supposed to exist. Therefore, it's you know wiped out of you know like historical analysis. But the Jewish Bund and what it stood for was also suppressed by the Zionist educational system, which took over all of the uh, Jewish educational institutions throughout uh, North America, South America. For instance, um, I went to a Jewish cheder, as it's called in Yiddish. In fact, English is not even my first language, and my first language is Yiddish, which is a German, a Jewish dialect of German from the Middle Ages, and it's not doesn't resemble Hebrew at all. Now, so I'm going to explain to you what the uh, Jewish Bundist uh, philosophy is, because it is the uh, fundamental critique of Zionism. That you may not know that the Jewish socialist movement was more popular than the Zionists amongst the Jewish community of Eastern Europe is essential to understanding the difference between Zionism and the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish people, basically. As a result, I was raised in the Jewish and anti-Zionist and anti at the same time. I did not have to torture myself to escape from a Zionist upbringing, since I was allowed to know that you don't have to be a Zionist to be Jewish. The culture as religion was assumed as a given, and although we did not care to consider the validity of the theocratic religious matters after the Holocaust, the congregation each Saturday morning was the key to life. In addition to the public Protestant English school in Toronto, I also studied at the Jewish Talmud Torah in the evenings. Talmud Torah means the study of the Torah. The educational methodology in the Torah study sessions was to read through all of the Hebrew version and translate it into English. One sentence after another over seven years, together with the other books like the Talmud, the Gemara, the Mishnah. It's a very elaborate, you know, culture. However, and the great consequence was that I actually knew what was written in the Torah and so knew that the Zionist pretensions were false as to their claims in Judaism for the establishment of this Zionist state. Aside from the matter of whether the deity is a valid concept or not, or not we can nonetheless delve into that historical text to find out what was intended in the first place rather than what the Torah has been manipulated to be believed. For example, while it is not mentioned, it is evident that the historical figures, who were called prophets by uh, named, you know, uh, Noah and Abraham, were historical figures that preceded the existence of the Jewish people or nation, and it may be, as it, as it may be called, as such, the covenant with Abraham was not a covenant with the Jewish people alone. This is evident if you just consider, you know, the basic facts that Abraham existed 500 years before the establishment of the Jewish people. <laughs> so right then and there, you know, you have a completely different perspective than what is presented, you know, by the Zionist ideology. In the text, as it is actually written, even in the re revised Ezra version, that the covenant for the land of Canaan for guarantee of residence and co-residence with the existing nations there, which were seven. There were seven nations coexisting in the Canaan territory there of what is now called the Holy Land, was for all the descendants of Abraham forever. And the word forever is exact. It is the actual word used in Hebrew in the Torah. And the word descendants, descendants of Abraham, is also translated as the seed of Abraham or the sons of Abraham. The latter